in this section, we are going to look at some revision question, questions on budgets. So, key three, three key areas or things to remember in relation to budgets. So, what might come up in the exam? First of all, you might get a nice theory question in our budgets area. For this, you need to understand the purpose and benefits of budgeting. As well as understanding, of course, each of the different budget types. In budget types, we can have our functional budgets, these are prepared first. This includes our sales budget, production budget, materials budgets, and labor budgets. Once we've prepared our functional budgets, we can prepare our master budgets. So our budgeted, our cash budget, our budgeted income statement, and our budgeted statement of financial position. You may also be asked about flexible budgets. Remember, flexible budgets are budgets which are adjusted to reflect our actual level of activity. So, let's have a look at a number of questions in this area. First question is just theory. We're asked which, of the, which two of the following are true for flexible budgets? Well, I've just said a flexible budget is one where we take our original budget and adjust it for any difference between our budgeted level of activity and our actual level of activity. By doing that, we are reflecting the fact that we know our variable costs and our sales revenue will change based on our level of activity. So it provides a more meaningful comparison between our actual results and our flexed budget. So which two of the following are true? Is a flexible budget one that is continually updated to reflect actual results? No, it is not. Flexible budget is one where at the end of the period we will adjust it only for changes in the level of activity. Is it a budget which is, which is built in contingency to allow for unforeseen events? No. Is it a budget which identifies the cost behavior of different cost items? Yes, it is. A flexible budget focuses on our fixed and our variable costs. Is it a budget which allows comparison of like with like? Yes, it is. Because we adjust for a change in our level of activity for our variable costs, we are recognizing that we expect them to change when the level of activity changes. So the correct answer then is D. Statements 3 and 4 are correct. Having a look at our next question, and you'll see once again theory. So we're asked, which of the following are benefits <coughs> of budgeting? Number one, it helps coordinate the activities of different departments. Most definitely. So if we look at our functional budgets, for example, if we prepare a sales budget, then we use that to communicate to our production department. So if our selling department is going to sell a thousand units, our production department needs to know via their production budget how many units they need to produce. And then we can follow that on. From that, we can prepare our materials purchases budget. So our purchasing department knows how, many, how much material they need to buy in order to meet our production budget, in order to meet our sales budget. So everyone knows what our objectives are. Second of all, it fulfills legal reporting obligations. No. Our budgeting is not a legal requirement. Um, it is something we do in order to ensure the efficient running of our business. 
Three, it establishes a system of control. Yes. Remember variances? So if we've set our budget or our targets at the start of the year, then during the year and at the end of the year, we can look to see, did everyone achieve, for example, their cost budgets? Or were people spending far too much money? Option four, our budgets are a starting point for strategic planning. No. <clears throat> our strategic planning will come first, and then our annual budgets should support whatever our strategic objectives are. So, the ones which are benefits of budgeting are options one and three. So, the correct answer then is B. Moving along to our next question, and you shouldn't be surprised now, again, theory. So, once again, which statements are true? <coughs> We're told the following statements relate to the participa participation of junior management in setting budgets. So, is it true that this will speed up the setting of budgets? Definitely not. So our budgeting process is going to be led by our senior management or our budget committee. Now, it would be much, much quicker if our budget committee could just establish this is our budget for the year, distribute it down to junior management and tell them to get on with achieving those budgets. If junior management are involved in the budgeting process, then it's going to be a lot more time consuming. There's going to have to be discussion between junior and senior management as to what reasonable standards or targets we should have in our budget. So it's going to take far longer. Okay, next statement. It increases the motivation of junior managers. This is absolutely true. It's one of the key reasons why junior management are involved in the budgeting process. If they're involved in setting the targets, they should be more motivated then to achieve those targets. Option three, it reduces the level of budget padding. Now, budget padding is a situation where, suppose I am the manager of a particular department and I have been asked to prepare my cost budget for the coming year. Now, suppose I've done an initial assessment, and I have concluded that my budgeted costs for the coming year are likely to be £10,000. Now, my performance is going to be partially assessed based on whether or not I achieve that budget or that target in the coming year. So if I think my costs are going to be £10,000, is that the figure I'm going to submit in my budget? Well, hopefully, but probably not. I'm probably going to add something on to that. So maybe I'll add on a few thousand pounds and submit a budgeted cost total of £12,000. And why have I done that? Because I know... If I've increased my budgeted costs a little bit, I've given myself some wiggle room. So I know I'm going to find it easier to achieve my cost target in the coming year. That is budget padding. If we, in, if we involve junior management in setting budgets, we're not going to reduce the level of budget padding. We're going to increase it. So the third statement is not true. The only true statement, then, is number two. So the correct answer is B. Next question. Which of the following best describes a principal budget factor? Well, you either know this one or you don't. A principal budget factor is going to be the starting point of our budgeting process. So we need to know what our principal budget factor is so we know where to start the preparation of all of our different budgets. Our principal budget factor is the factor which limits the activities of an organization. Usually, 
it's going to be our sales. So for most companies, they will produce as many units as there are customers out there prepared to buy their product. So our sales demand is the thing that limits our activities. Now, we can have other principal budget factors, so perhaps limited availability of materials or labor hours from our production line workers and so on. Um, but either way, we need to know what our principal budget factor is. We will always begin our budgeting process by calculating the budget which contains our principal budget factor. And all of our other budgets will flow from that first budget, usually the sales budget. Now, finally, we get to a budget question that does involve some calculations. But you can see then how there can be a theory focus on these budgeting questions. Let's have a look at this one anyway. So we're asked, what is the budgeted raw material purchases for next period in kilograms? So we're told a company manufactures and sells one product which requires eight kilograms of raw materials in its manufacture. The budgeted data relating to the next period are as follows. So we have our sales and opening and closing inventory information. We're also told about our raw material, what our opening and closing inventory is going to be. So to calculate how many kilograms of material we need to purchase during the year, then the first thing we have to do is work out our material usage. So how many units of our product are we going to produce? And how much material will we need in order to produce those units? Once we've done that, we can work out, well, how much material will we need to go out and buy? So starting then with our production budget. How many units are we going to produce? Well, we've, told that, we've been told that our budgeted sales are 19,000 units. We've been told that our closing inventory needs to be 3,000. Remember, if we have a closing inventory requirement, then that will increase the number of units we have to produce. And we've been told that we'll have an opening inventory ready to be sold of 4,000 units. Remember, opening inventory reduces the number of units we have to produce. So our total production for the period then will be 18,000 units. We've been told in the question that each unit will use 8 kilograms of material. So our material usage is 8 kilograms per unit. So our total usage, 144,000 kilograms. So during the year, we're going to use 144,000 kilograms of material. But is that the correct answer? Well, no. And we know that for two reasons. First of all, because it's not one of the answers listed in our multi-choice. But also, very importantly, we've been told we're also going to have an opening and closing inventory of our raw materials. Remember, our raw materials purchases are going to be our material usage plus our closing inventory of materials minus our opening inventory of materials. So if we adjust then again for our closing inventory, we're told we'll be fit, needs to be 53,000 kilograms. And our opening inventory, 50,000 kilograms. So our purchases then 
147,000. So, our material purchases during the year, then 147,000 kilograms. And hopefully this is in our list of options, and we can see it there. The correct answer is B. In our next question, then, we're going to have a quick look at labor budgets. So we're asked in this question, what is the budgeted cost of unskilled labor for the period? Now remember, our labor cost for the period is going to be the total number of labor hours that will be worked multiplied by our labor rate per hour. So we're told a company is a budget for two products, A and B, as follows. We have our sales, our production, and then we're told about our skilled and our unskilled labor. Now, we've only been asked about our unskilled labor, so that's all we're interested in. We've been told our unskilled labor is paid at $7 per hour. So what we need to work out then is how many hours will our unskilled labor be working for? We have two products. We're going to produce 1,750 units of A and 5,000 units of B. We've been told that the hours per unit for our unskilled labor, three hours for A and four hours for product B. So our total then, 5,250 and 20,000. So our labor cost will be 25,250 multiplied by our rate per hour, so 176,750. So the correct answer is C. Now our final question in this section just one final theory one, we're asked which two of the following are most likely to influence the motivation of budget holders? One, the contents of the budget manual. Unlikely, that's really just an administration item. The extent of participation in budget setting. Absolutely, so we mentioned earlier, if you're involved in setting the targets, that will motivate you more. The level of difficulty of the budgets, that will affect your motivation. If the, the level of difficulty is far too hard, it's going to be incredibly demotivating because you'll never be able to achieve the standards. And the structure of the budget committee, again, is an administrative issue more than a motivational one. So the correct answer then is B, 2 and 3.